All right, uh, hello and welcome everyone to my talk on a billion open interfaces for Eva Mallory. And today I'm going to present to you how the security and privacy of Apple device users can be compromised uh, through several different wireless attacks. Um, we started this project to open up Apple's wireless ecosystem, which consists of more than 1.4 billion devices, including iPhone and Mac. And most of these wireless services, such as AirDrop, Auto Unlock, and Handoff, for example, uh, use a proprietary uh, Wi-Fi-based link layer called Apple Wireless Direct Link uh, in combination with Bluetooth LE. And in the first step, we reverse engineered two of the involved protocols, in particular AWDL and AirDrop, and re-implemented them and make the code available on GitHub. Um, based on these results, we finally conducted a comprehensive security and privacy analysis uh, where we found several vulnerabilities that allowed us to successfully perform uh, user tracking, uh, denial of service attacks, and finally a man in the middle attack on AirDrop. Uh, we proposed mitigations for all vulnerabilities, and Apple has been fixing those uh, uh, in the last updates. Um, all right, now I want to give an overview of the vulnerabilities and attacks that we discovered. Uh, first, uh, we were able to mount a user tracking attack as AWDL leaks, for example, the Wi-Fi chip's real MAC address, uh, and also the, its host name, uh, which in the default case also contains, not sure if you can see it, oh, okay, uh, uh, the user's name. Uh, we made the attack practical using a remote activation attack which exploits uh, the discovery mechanism uh, of Bluetooth LE uh, and enables us to turn on AWDL uh, interfaces uh, on nearby devices. Uh, using the same activation attack, we were able to exploit two implementation bugs in the Wi-Fi driver, uh, which allowed us to wirelessly crash devices without any user interaction. Um, in addition, we discovered a protocol level denial of service attack on AWDL, which um, breaks communication uh, via desynchronization. And then finally, with such a denial of service attack in place, uh, we were able to mount an amend in the middle attack on AirDrop. Due to time constraints today, I'm only going to focus on, well, essentially two of them. Um, but before I can go into detail about any of those attacks, I need to explain the full stack operation of AirDrop. Uh, starting from the Bluetooth uh, discovery mechanism to the HTTP-based data transmission. So AirDrop requires two devices that are within communication range of each other, and the initiator, which I will call Jane throughout this uh, talk, starts the AirDrop discovery mechanism uh, to detect nearby AirDrop receivers simply by opening the sharing pane on her phone. Uh, she computes, in the first step, she computes hashes of her own contact identifiers. In particular, her Apple ID and associated phone numbers, and also other email addresses. She then starts sending out uh, BLE advertisements, uh, which include the first two bytes of those hashes. And on the other end, the AirDrop-enabled receiver device, uh, of which I will call John throughout this uh, talk, regularly performs scans for those advertisements. And if John receives a new advertisement and is set to be discoverable by everyone, it will immediately turn on its AWDL interface. Um, if John, on the other hand, uh, makes itself discoverable by contacts only, it will first check whether any uh, of the hashes uh, matches uh, an entry in its own address book. Well, now both devices have turned on their Wi-Fi interface and conduct the synchronization procedure uh, of AWDL, uh, which in effect creates a wireless direct link uh, between the two devices. And I'm skipping the complex details of this protocol uh, in this talk, but if you want to know more about it, uh, we refer to our previous Mobicom paper uh, that was presented last year. And now all subsequent communication of AirDrop will take place over this interface. Uh, so next, the initiator starts discovery via Bonjour and asking for the AirDrop service and uh, will receive responses from all devices in proximity that have AirDrop enabled. Um, now for every received response, uh, the initiator will then attempt an authentication handshake. And in this step, Jane and John want to find out whether or not the other party is authentic. Uh, that means whether or not they are mutual contacts. 
And to achieve this goal, Jane established a TLS connection with John uh, using client and service certificates. And the common name of such a certificate contains a random UUID. This will become important later. Um, then via the TLS connection, Jane sends a discover request uh, via HTTP. And this request uh, contains the sender's record data. What is the record data? Um, so the record data itself um, consists of the UUID that is also included in the certificate uh, and also contains a list of the hashed contact identifiers that we've seen before, but this time in full. All right, uh, now John will perform a number of checks to verify that the uh, discovery request uh, is valid. So first, he will verify that the signature of the record data, um, which is uh, appended to uh, the UUID and the hashes, uh, well, is valid. Uh, second, he checks that the UUID from the TLS certificate is actually the same as the one included in the record data, uh, which prevents replay attacks. And finally, he will test if any of Jane's hashed contact identifiers in the record data matches a contact entry in his own address book. And in case all of those checks succeed, uh, John will send uh, an appropriate response, including his own record data to Jane. Uh, Jane then conducts the same checks again uh, as John before, and if they all pass, then John's re uh, receiver icon appears in the user interface. Now the actual data transfer can take place. After selecting the receiver icon, uh, Jane sends an ask request to John, which includes a file preview, which is displayed to, uh, displayed to John to make the decision whether or not he wants to accept the file. And if he does, again, he will send uh, a proper response, uh, upon which Jane then starts transmitting the actual file in an upload request. After the complete file is transferred, John sends, again, another 200 OK message, and the transaction is complete. So far, so good. Uh, now I want to go into the details of some of the attacks, and I'm going to present to you first uh, the user tracking attack. So the key problem that we found was that AWDL broadcasts unencrypted control frames that contain identifiable information, such as the MAC address of the currently connected access point, uh, and also the real MAC address of the Wi-Fi card, which effectively defeats MAC randomization, which they actually uh, deployed uh, for the source address field. And in addition, uh, there is a protocol field that contains the host name of the device, and this typically contains actually the user's name. Okay, so this is a problem, but uh, to make this practical and to allow for tracking via AWDL, uh, an attacker needs to activate the interfaces of nearby devices as uh, the interface is usually broadcasting, is only broadcasting action frames when an application ex uh, explicitly requested it, such as AirDrop, for example. And to do this, we exploit uh, AirDrop's BLE discovery mechanism by using a brute force attack. And as we recall, each frame of those BLE advertisements can contain up to four contact hashes uh, with a length of just two bytes. And now if we iterate through the search space and send out different BLE uh, advertisements quickly, uh, we achieve a wraparound time of about 30 seconds. And well, but for this we need to have low level access uh, to the BLE stack. Um, so we implemented it on a cheap BBC microbit, which features a Nordic Bluetooth chip. All right, but uh, well, since uh, we don't, we typically, an address book has more than one contact in it, right? Um, so, um, in, in practice, uh, the uh, response times are much, much shorter. And uh, so, well, in practice, we get about like one to 10 seconds uh, of uh, response times, which means that an attacker that is in proximity of a device uh, Need on, needs only a couple of seconds to start tracking a nearby device. Okay, um, we ran an experimental vulnerability analysis using this attack in different environments and found that we can detect about twice as many Apple devices uh, as before. And in addition, we also evaluated in how many cases the device 
host name that was transmitted in these frames uh, actually contained a person's name. And for this, we compared string segments from the host name uh, with two US databases for given and family names and found that in more than 75% of the cases, a name was included. And this matches uh, the results of a, of a user study that we also conducted in parallel to this. And there, 68% uh, of the participants indicated uh, that their device name actually included their real name. Now, what can we do uh, to protect against this? In the paper, we proposed to simply remove the privacy compromising fields from the broadcast frames. And this is exactly what Apple has been doing. Uh, in particular, they removed the BSSID as well as the, as well as the Wi-Fi card's real MAC address from these frames. And in addition, uh, we have found that Apple seems to have implemented uh, the host name randomization mechanism that we also proposed in the paper. Uh, and we saw that in the current iOS 13 beta. Um, so now, instead of a name, the host name consists of a random UUID. That's pretty cool. OK, so all right, that was user tracking. Let's talk about the man in the middle attack. You remember the airdrop authentication mechanism. Recall that the receiver icon of John is displayed uh, upon receiving a valid response from John. And now I want to move your attention to the receiver symbol in the sharing pane. So in the best case, Jane and John are contacts of each other, and Jane has a contact picture of John in her address book. So, and if the authentication procedure uh, succeeds, uh, that picture will actually be displayed. And uh, this gives Jane a hint that the connection is, in fact, authentic. However, we have found via a user study that only 27% uh, of Apple device users regularly tag their address book contacts with pictures. So now the question is, what if Jane uh, does not have a contact photo of John? Or what if John is not, not a contact of Jane? And in both cases, uh, a gray shade replacement symbol is displayed. Um, and here the problem is uh, that an untrained user will not be able to really differentiate between the two, uh, because we also didn't find any Apple documentation explicitly stating the difference between displaying the initials, which constitute an authentic contact, and uh, just a silhouette symbol, which will be like an unauthentic peer. And for the upcoming man in the middle attack, we'll exploit exactly that UI weakness. Now let's get back to the authentication. As before, Jane sends a discover request to John. But this time, an attacker is also within communication range. And the goal of the attacker is to prevent that the handshake uh, ever completes successfully. And therefore, we mount a denial of service attack to prevent direct communication between the two targets. In this particular case, we can use a TCP reset attack to terminate the underlying TCP connection. And to mount the attack, we use our own implementation of AWDL to be able to overhear TCP connections uh, between Jane and John and to inject our own messages. Um, and because the TCP reset attack prevents John from ever responding to Jane directly, John's icon never appears in the sharing pane. So now the attacker is actually in a man in the middle po uh, position because they're not able to discover each other. Um, and now what the attacker will try to do is find out uh, whether John would accept files from himself. And so that means whether John is discoverable by everyone. Uh, because otherwise, he will just reject any file transmissions. And we can do this by periodically probing John, uh, probing John um, using our own discover requests. And John will indicate uh, that he is discoverable by everyone or not, by not including or by including his device name in the, in the response. And while the ongoing denial of service attack might actually force John at some point uh, to try a different setting, and well, in that case, John uh, will give a positive response. And the attacker will then spoof John's identity and immediately start advertising an airdrop service via Bonjour. And since Jane still has the sharing pin open, she continuously scans for those uh, airdrop advertisements. And so she will eventually attempt to authenticate to our attacker. 
So she sends this discovery request to which the attacker happily replies with John as the computer name. And finally, the attacker's spoofed receiver icon appears uh, in the sharing pane. All right, so the rest of the attack is rather straightforward. Um, first, the attacker forwards the ask request and the responses as is uh, to keep the original thumbnail in place and make the transmission uh, request seem legit. In the second step, however, the attacker replaces the original upload file with its own. And this way, an attacker is able to send a uh, possibly malicious file uh, or link to the receiver. Um, OK, so let's talk about mitigation. Um, also here in the new iOS 13 beta, uh, we've seen that Apple reworked uh, the sharing pane. And now with the new design, it seems to be uh, it's much easier to distinguish between authentic contacts, your own devices, and other unauthentic other devices. All right, let me summarize our work. So first, we reverse engineered both AirDrop and AWDL, implemented our own versions of them, and made, have made them available on GitHub. Uh, and there's also a small how-to for getting, for example, uh, AirDrop running on a Raspberry Pi if you're interested. And uh, it seems that the code has already found its way into the security community as it has been reported to be been used uh, during Black Hat last week, uh, which we find pretty cool. So our vulnerability disclosures also resulted in several fixes from Apple, um, and we received several CVE numbers for it, um, with possibly more to come in the next major OS releases. And finally, we will direct our efforts towards other services in Apple's wireless ecosystem, such as Handoff, Auto Unlock, and so on. And we're excited to review AWDL's standardized uh, successor, which is called Neighbor Awareness Networking, which is already uh, available on Android. Um, and we think uh, that this will also likely come to uh, Apple's operating system in the near future. And with this, I thank you, and we'll happily try to answer any questions that you might have. Questions for our speaker? Hi, uh, Hi. Really cool stuff here you demonstrate. I'm wondering, how do you know that the, or how do you verify that your implementation of these closed proprietary protocols actually matches their protocols? Well, we have implemented it, and it works with actual Apple devices. Oh, okay. If that's and what okay. you're asking. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Other questions for our speaker? So I do have a question uh, while our uh, next uh, speaker comes forward to set up. Uh, I was wondering, uh, so um, you've got uh, four CVEs and possibly many more to come, it looks like. Many uh, more, maybe not, but uh, yeah. maybe more, I don't know. Uh, so I w something I'm curious with, um, most of my um, vulnerability disclosures come in the context of uh, more traditionally deployed software, not something like a wireless stack. And I was wondering if you had any insights as to how the process might be different in that case as opposed to uh, maybe um, other domains. So can you just repeat the question? I'm not sure. Sure. So, so, uh, so um, how, is, how, is the, how is the vulnerability disclosure process? The vulnerability disclosure process? Well, I guess it's probably the same. It was my first vulnerability disclosure, so I don't have much experience. Um, but well, Apple has a product security team that you can con contact via email. And well, you send them essentially the paper and what you found, and then you get feedback on it, so. Great, <laughs> well, um, uh, let's thank our speaker one more time.